Hi, this is Richard Chismar, and I'm here with my good friend and co-author of the Gwendy Button Box Trilogy, Stephen King. Thanks, Richard. It's great to be here. It's great to see you in person. Steve, thanks for hanging out with me today to talk about the Gwendy audiobooks and answer a few frequently asked questions from fans of the series. I think that we ought to start uh, by you explaining to the audience uh, how you saved Gwendy from an early grave. Well, I'm not sure I saved her. I think sooner or later you would have clicked on that icon and and and, and brought her back. But uh, what happened is I still remember we were exchanging emails and then we started talking about collaborations. And you uh, you brought up the fact that you had started a story that you had never been able to finish. And and the rest, the, honestly, the rest is kind of a blur. Um, you know, we had that conversation. I was I was like, oh, I'd love to read it. And it showed up the next day. And, uh, you know, I, I remember your very short note that was attached said, uh, do do with it as you wish. And I and I wrote back and said, you, you want me to try to finish it? You know, you were probably too polite to say hell no. So you said, sure, if you think you can. So it, it kind of that's kind of how it started. And, and um, you know, it's funny because you saying that ties in with the first question that that the good folks at Simon Schuster gave me, which was people really want to know how did Gwendy first come to life? Like, and, and you're responsible for that because she was your creation to start with. Well, she was my creation to start with. And uh, I thought of a, a little girl in Castle Rock who was 12 years old and kind of uh, a little bit pudgy and trying to lose weight and running up and down this staircase that's called the Suicide Stairs. And she meets this strange man who gives her a button box and it has all these colored buttons on it. And there's one for Asia, one for Australia, one for North and South America. And uh, they do bad things. And she is supposed to be the guardian of this box. And uh, I loved that idea. And I had an idea about, uh, well, there was a red button that was supposed to be the anything button. And you could think of something, but it would turn out wrong somehow. It would always turn out wrong. And Gwendy tries to test that, and I was thinking, well, maybe Gwendy Peterson caused Jonestown. Ugh. And I got that, and then I thought, I don't know where to go with this from, from that point. Uh, and so I turned it over to you, and you carried <laughs> the ball across the goal line and, and, and then went on to Gwendy's Magic Feather, and... I thought that was fantastic. And I thought, mm -mm, Gwendy can't be done yet. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. That was fun when I, uh, I started receiving texts from you one evening about uh, maybe what if Gwendy did this and Gwendy did that? And I, I just remember my, my smile kept getting bigger. And at the end, I was like, uh, hey, are we going to write this one together? And you're like, I think so. So yeah, that was know, fun. It, it, it came to me complete. That rarely happens to me. It came to me complete. And I thought this could be the best of the three Gwendy books. And I think it I think it turned out that way. I agree. I agree. Well, what's funny is you say it came to you complete. I remember and it, this leads to the next question. Uh, we're, we're really good at this, by the way. We should be talk show hosts because we're, we're like leading each other on. You can tell we've done this before. But um, I was going to say people were really curious about our, our process, you know, the collaborative process and kind of the nuts and the bolts of, of how you did it. And when people ask, well, ask me that, I always I always get the feeling that they think it's a little more complicated than it was, you know, because really we just said here, your turn, your turn. But what's interesting is with this third book, you know, when you're collaborating, you never know what you're getting, you know, what's coming next and where you have to take it. And I remember for the third book, I was so excited. And then and I'm not, we're not giving anything away when we talk about the space station because that's on the jacket copy and that kind of thing. But I just remember, I remember having that moment of pure terror when I realized I don't know a darn thing about space and space travel. And what have we done? And But it ended up being so much fun. And thanks to Robin Firth, you know, your, your research uh, expert, you know, she, she took us a long way. Robin did a terrific job. And uh, she told us all about uh, what the chairs would look like, uh, what the angle was, what the space station would sort of look like, uh, 
do a lot of stuff that, that we didn't know about the food and how you would eat in zero G and, and all that. But uh, you just handled that so beautifully. And uh, of course you brought it back to, to dairy and I brought it back to some of the dark tower stuff. And uh, it turned out to be, you know, when they talk about collaboration, Rich, it's a little bit like you had a bunch of ingredients, I had a bunch of ingredients, but then it gets stirred around so that it's hard to tell who did what. Right. That's that's the thing. I mean, you know, by now we've we've you know we've read it enough to be sick of it. But between the different passes for the different publishers, and uh, that's the neat thing is you, I, you do stumble upon passages where you're like, wait a minute. You know, I'm not sure who wrote that paragraph. And that's a neat feeling. I mean, especially for me. Yeah, it was great. It was great. And uh, of course, folks, Rich didn't mean that about reading it till we get sick of it. We never get sick. <laughs> we always love it. And you will, too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I agree. People are fascinated with this, that, you know, you've you've written, obviously, hundreds of stories all by yourself. That's how you started out. And, and then you decided, eh, I'm going to let some people kind of into play. And, and you you did some some neat stuff with Peter Straub and Stuart O'Nan. And to me, the coolest of all is, you know, with with Joe and, and Owen, your sons. What is it that that you like the most or that you enjoy the most about the collaborative process and then flip the coin? You know, what do you find the most challenging? Well, the thing that's the best about it is that it always has a different flavor. I've written probably 65 books and I have a certain flavor. Of course, I try to change it up. Uh, everybody does and try to get a little bit of a different style, different texture, uh, different, uh, uh, what do they call it? Uh, the third person, the first person, uh, all that stuff. But basically, it's all coming through my head. But when I add uh, Joe to the mix or Owen, we wrote a book called Sleeping Beauties together that was a, a fabulous experience. And then working with you was a fabulous experience too because there are all different flavors. One of the things about working with you where we were like a uh, hand in a glove is that you get regular people. You get suburban life, small town life, uh, cutting the grass, uh, having coffee and cake uh, at night with your parents, doing a jigsaw puzzle, all that stuff. You get it. Not everybody does. And uh, so that made working with you a particular pleasure. And also, you're a pro, you know, and it's, it's great to work with a pro. Thank you. Yeah, no, it was, it was fun. And I'll never forget in the beginning of Final Task. At some point early on, you sent me an email that said, Rich, um, strap in because I don't really outline and we're just going where we go. And, and that pretty much described that experience because we really did. And I, and I know at some point I sent you a very uh, corny text, which which essentially said, hey, I think this is what collaborations are supposed to be like. You know, <laughs> they're, they're supposed to be first and foremost fun, um, but they're also supposed to, you know, they're not supposed to have that really tight, you know, restrictions. We just, you know, I think we had the freedom to do what we wanted. And, and like you said, I kind of took us back to dairy and, and I, I still have no idea how I had the, the cojones to do that because that's your, that's your country. That's your uh, town. But for some reason I was drawn there and I expected to e either get back a, Hey, this is kind of cool from you or what have you done? I'm erasing the last 50 pages, <laughs> but you took that, that was great. so much better. It was great, and it all it all worked out, and and uh, we sort of knew, you know, I'm not going to do spoilers here, uh, but we knew kind of where we had to come out based on what was locked in from Wendy's button box way back at the beginning, but basically, you know, this particular book, Wendy's Final Task, is a standalone, but it's enriched by the other two books as well, because you see the development of this character. And no, man, I didn't know exactly how it was going to end. And uh, you didn't know how it was going to end. But, you know, that's part of the thrill of it, because if we don't know, listeners sure aren't going to know, right?
Yeah, well, that's it. It was very it was exhilarating for me because I didn't know where we were going. But at the same time, I obviously had complete trust in you. And somewhere along the way, I started trusting myself, which always takes me a little while in, in every new book. But uh, man, yeah, I mean, I, the, the word I keep using and, and people are probably going to get sick of hearing it, but I'm like, I had fun. And, you know, as you know, as well, you know, better than anyone, probably not every book is fun. Some of them mm. are, are tougher than others. I just keep telling people it's the kind of book that made me fall in love with reading. And uh, that. reading that book, it, it was kind of like a time capsule. And it just took me back to being young and going to the library every day. And uh, yeah, it, it just it, it reminded me of, of those days. And, and that was a gift. So thank you. Thank you. And uh, I think that I think that a, a good story, the purpose of a good story is to make the reader forget their their own lives for a while and their own troubles. And Gwendy does that. And yeah. uh, I think. I think that it's a hell of a good ride and I'm really, I'm really happy with it. Me too. Me too. So I can't wait to hear it on audio. You know, we were very fortunate to have Maggie Siff and Marin Ireland narrate the Gwendy series. I know you're a longtime fan of audiobooks, both not only as a creator, but also as a listener. Um, what attracts you so much to that format? Well, I think that the best thing about audiobooks is you can't peek ahead to see what's going to happen next. You, you don't know from one paragraph to another what's going to come next. You know, one of the things that if you read a lot of books, you can turn to a certain page and look at it and say, oh, well, this is all narration because I don't see any short paragraphs. Or you turn a page and you say, this is all dialogue uh, because I see a lot of white space there. You don't do that. You don't know what's going to happen in an audio book. And you can't, your eye can't skip ahead. I mean, sometimes, obviously, you're driving along in your car and you're listening to an audio book uh, and you see something that's sort of interesting and you lose the thread for a minute, but you can always go back. You can always rewind or punch the button that takes it back 15 seconds. And as a writer, you know, I listen to, I don't reread my books that often. Uh, because I wouldn't have time, there's so many of them. But, yeah. <laughs> but I always listen to the audiobooks because they're unforgiving. You hear everything. You hear the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, if there's a fluff, if there's a mistake, word repetition, unconscious, unmeaningful rhyme, you hear all that stuff. And I love that because when they're good, they're really good. I, I started getting interested in this way back when I was teaching high school, when I had uh, uh, Cademon uh, records of T.S. Eliot reading The Wasteland. Oh, and wow. I thought to myself, you can't beat the audio experience. I mean, isn't that the basis of what story where storytelling started? It was an, it was an oral tradition before. Right. And you can scare people. You can scare the hell out of, out of people with an audio book if the reading's good. And these, these two women are pros, and uh, people are going to be really pleased when they hear the, the reading, I think. Yeah, that's great. I, I mean, I'm just, I am an audiobook convert. It took me a while, um, but I love it now. My, uh, my, my oldest son, Billy, is, has been a big uh, um, force in, in convincing me to start listening. He listened to, and I know I told you this before, but he listened to the whole Dark Tower series both while driving and walking his new dog. He takes him out for about a two hour walk every morning. And uh, it's been a while, he's not a puppy anymore. Cause you can tell, cause the dark tower, I don't know how many pages the entire series is, but he listened to it. He didn't read a word of it. He listened to every word on audio tape. And, and you, me. he did read every word of it because it is the same thing. It's just like uh, two different versions of, of the same thing, but it is That's basically true. the same story. And that's, I mean, you know, because you're a recent convert, that you have to learn how to do it. Right. Uh, you have to put your head in that space. It's the same way, like, uh, uh, I can remember getting a Kindle and having to teach myself to read all over again on the screen rather than on the page. And I'm still, I, I can never read a book on a Kindle or listen to an audio book without actually having the physical book, the bound book somewhere where I can check back on it. I just, 
I want to have both. But I love that experience, and I love the idea of, particularly on a long, boring ride, there's nothing like an audio book to take you away. Yeah, yeah. I've started listening to them when I mow the lawn now with the headphones, and uh, yeah. I've yet to drive into the pond while I was listening to a good story, but I have done that listening to music. So, so books are safer for me. So, so the last thing that uh, I wanted to touch on here, um, which is a kind of a combination of a reader question, but I kind of cheated and, and, and turned it around is this, we've both been playing in the dark fiction sandbox for a long time now. And, and, and I referenced the fact that in some of our emails and, and texts, I kind of have referred to you and I as genre dinosaurs, um, which, which always makes us both kind of, you know, say, Hey, we're, we're, we're lucky to be here. Um, but what is it, what is it, you know, that you think keeps drawing us back to this kind of fiction after so many years, both as readers and writers? For me, it's a, a way to break free of the mundane life. I love the idea, for instance, when, when uh, Richard Ferris hands Gwendy the button box and tells her what it does, my mind says, this is so great. I'm out of the cage of the everyday life where things happen and, and so I love the the flight of the imagination you know I like right. that but I also kind of like the idea of saying to myself what would I do in that situation let's set up a situation where something really unusual happens and then say well what does this say about human behavior and in that sense we're talking about real uh the, the, the real, it seems to me, the real purpose of fiction and literature. One of the things, you know, you did a book called Chasing the Boogeyman, and it's set in that suburban world, and it deals with uh, the sudden outbreak of violence, murder, strangeness, and uh, possible serial killers. There are supernatural elements there, and you introduce that into the world of uh, suburban America, and you see what people do with that. And I have to believe that that was part of what drew you on with that story. The idea of, well, what is it? What does it mean? What does it do to people when something really terrible happens? Because we all face terrible things in our lives. Right. And you hit the nail on the head. There was also a huge uh, aspect of what would I do? And in, in that book, but also I hear that from Gwendy readers all the time because of that button box and because because they followed her entire lifespan, you know, in, in these books, you know, yeah. they're able to place themselves no matter their age, no matter their position in life, they're kind of able to place themselves in her shoes. And, and I think that's why personally, I've always loved Wendy so much is because, you know, she is very human. She has her faults, but she has a pure heart, you know, at the center of her. And, and that's what we all, you know, aspire to be. Um, well, that's that's why Ferris gives her the button box in the right. first place, because he feels that she can withstand the temptation to push those buttons. And then yeah. you have to ask yourself, could I do that? Could I withstand the temptation to push the buttons? Yeah, I, I, that red button would trouble me. I know that. <laughs> I'd have to get those uh, chocolates that you pull a little lever on the side and you get a chocolate and it clarifies your mind. Yeah, but that just as, as a uh, reformed uh, drug addict and alcoholic, that would fit with me. To know <laughs> the chocolates, yeah. <laughs> well, listen, I think we're pretty much out of time, but uh, this has been a pleasure. And um, I, it's I, always great. I, to I appreciate. See I appreciate you being here. It's great to see you. Thanks, Rich. Thank you. Thanks for hanging out. Okay, you bet.